that the highest king should welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me in, oh, his love for me, oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free. child of God. Yes, I am. Free at last, he has ransomed me. His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Sunsets free, oh, is free in me. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I in our hearts and our minds. Lord, we, nothing else around us matters, but that we are your child. We love you, Lord. Amen. Hey, if you want to grab somebody by the neck or the hand, or, I mean nicely, and just say hi. <laughs> Good morning, good morning, <clears throat> good morning. Welcome, welcome. We're really glad you're here. It's good to be worshiping the Lord together, amen? Yeah. Amen. <clears throat> we have some announcements in our bulletin. Uh, first of all, if you are new here, if you're new to Mountain Christian Church, immediately after this service down in the fellowship hall, there will be our monthly starting point coffee. 
Uh, it's a chance to meet more people, talk to some of the elders, ask questions, get to know more about our church. Uh, so if you're new, if you've recently started coming, or maybe you've been attending for some time but want to go deeper in your relationship with Mountain Christian Church, uh, all are invited to that Starting Point Coffee downstairs after this service. There are also uh, some opportunities for women's Bible study. The Women's Community Bible Study has already started, but you can still join. There's still time to join. If you're interested, contact Pam Cravens or Kay Willitson. Also, the Ladies Titus II ministry will be starting a new series on spiritual discipline starting in October. So if you're interested in that, contact Trish or Zigian or Emily Gray. And now we're going to bring up Chris and Shannon and Bernadette for a very exciting announcement. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah. Okay, good. All right. So. We are here to sort of introduce and talk about the front porch plan. We are thinking um, that this would be a good idea for Mountain Christian Church. So, so there are many good reasons why this project would benefit our church. <laughs> Extending this area is going to give us more enjoyable space for activities so that we will be able to serve our community better. Our church will be able to host larger groups by utilizing both the indoor and outdoor spaces. And um, so here are the following, are just a few activities that will be better served by the additional space. Um, for example, potlucks. Wouldn't it be nice to have both indoor and outdoor? Outdoor worship services, the youth activities, VBS, weddings, funerals. I mean, things we haven't even thought of yet. Um, the front porch can be used to sit and visit with friends. Um, you can bring a lunch and enjoy by yourself or with others. You can host your family fellowship gatherings there, um, have an outdoor Bible study, enjoy a cup of coffee or some tea. These are just a few great ideas that I think that we, you know, will be great for us. It will be nice to have shelter from the hot sun and summer rains. It will give us a place to sit and enjoy. The front porch will help to build community. And Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching and who doesn't enjoy gathering together in a nice place, right? Thank you, Bernadette. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I certainly have had a, certain, a great appreciation for outdoor spaces within the last two years. Um, we have all enjoyed the fact that we've had a space to go out to eat, to gather with friends. Um, and so uh, that's kind of where this idea came about was we thought, hey, that's a great idea just to have permanently at Mountain Christian. So we're kicking off the campaign today. Um, our t there's a bulletin, a flyer in your bulletin um, with information as well as there was some stuff that went out on link this week. Um, we would love for you to reach out to any one of our team if you have questions, comments, or recommendations. Um, this is a work in progress as we develop it. Um, and so we really want feedback from you and from the community. Um, this is a space for everybody. So um, we hope that you will get behind it and pray about it, see where God would lead you to be a part of this. If you would like to make a donation, you can simply put MCC front porch as a designation on your donation and it will go towards this effort. Thank you. Today is the 21st anniversary of the terrorist attacks of 9-11. It is a time we honor those who died and grieve with the families who lost loved ones. 
And yet this year feels different. After 20 years of futility in Afghanistan and Iraq, after so many lives lost and shattered, so much treasure squandered, all of it swept away like so many forgotten empires before us, the meaning of it all becomes duller, harder to grasp. In the ash caked years immediately after, it seemed clear what to pray for, what to ask God for, for justice, for protection, perhaps even for vengeance, certainly for help, help fixing this broken world as we sent forth our armies and aid workers and diplomats. And yet here we are two decades later, the world is no less broken, but we as a nation have become even more broken. The lines seem less defined now. For some, the call for justice feels less certain as our nation has since acted unjustly. The same with the call for vengeance as we see killing beget more killing and wonder if it will ever end. And that call for building a better world, this too feels different as we have seen humanity stubbornly resist this imagined better world. So for some, 9-11 is a date that now brings despair. The clarity that once was has festered into an ache. The shock and horror of that fateful day, which felt so particular to us, so specific, so unique, is starting to feel like just one more in a long line of terrible days when we humans do awful things to one another. For some of us then, there is the temptation of hopelessness. 21 years ago, did we really think we'd be here? And yet there's a certain relief in the hopelessness. The Bible teaches that this world cannot be fixed and that it is in fact a hopeless pursuit to think we can solve this problem because it is a problem of the human heart. We read in Ecclesiastes, that which is crooked cannot be straightened. This world is so very crooked and it cannot be straightened. But far from leading to despair, we can find respite in knowing that the Bible agrees that this world is lost. This world is going to burn away. We are not to become too attached to it. This world is crooked because our hearts are made crooked with sin. We cannot make them straight by ourselves. We cannot fix this world nor save it. We can but pray for redeemed hearts. There is comfort in this knowledge that our hope is not in this world but in the next. Our hope is in the new creation that Jesus will one day usher in where we will have new hearts, hearts no longer made crooked by sin. Does that mean that we cease to strive? Does it mean that none of it matters? No. We comfort the widow and care for the orphan because our God comforts widows and cares for orphans, and we serve a loving God. We seek justice because our God is a just God, and we honor him by working for it. And we protect the innocent from those who would do them harm because our Lord is a good shepherd. But on those days when the task feels impossible, when we've exhausted ourselves at the outer limits of human wisdom, we can also rest in knowing it is ultimately out of our hands. The crooked cannot be made straight. Only God can do that. And God has promised that he will one day make it all straight. Until then, there will be more days like this, monuments to human folly and futility. But let us not despair. Instead, let us use these days to celebrate the hope that we do have, the hope that cannot be corrupted or jeopardized or altered, the hope that is beyond human reach. And that is the hope that Jesus Christ gives us. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, we thank you for the hope you've secured for us with your precious blood. We confess that without it, we are utterly lost. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come and take what is yours. Come quickly. 
Our world needs you. Maranatha. Spirit alive in 
to declare your promise, my soul now to stand. So what can I say? And what can I do? But offer this heart of Stand beside the heroes of 
join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the faith and with one voice a thousand generations sing worthy is the lamb who was slain forever he shall reign us gathered around you. What a beautiful day it's going to be. We thank you, Lord, that you are waiting for us, that you are always, always, always here for us. We love you. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. You're hidden What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. Didn't want heaven without us, so Jesus you brought heaven down. Sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is! What a wonderful name it is! The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is! Nothing comes. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of What a powerful name it is, 
the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. You are above all and in all. You are our great God. We love you, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Earlier, we reflected on human futility and how this world is lost. But we found reason to rejoice, for Christ is bringing a new world, so in place of futility, we have hope. As we prepare for communion, I'd like to draw out what this new world looks like. And perhaps the best way to do this is to contrast the new creation with this present world. And to do that, we return to Ecclesiastes, where the author, called the teacher and thought to be Solomon, offers the most incisive analysis of what life in this world is like. Over and over again, the teacher refers to life under the sun. For Solomon, the sun is the symbolic boundary between this life here, this mortal, material, finite life, and the life of God. For most of the book, Solomon seeks meaning by looking into his own heart and what it desires and by looking at the world and what it offers. But try as he may, he cannot find meaning. It is elusive. Every time he thinks he has hold of it, it slips away. It turns out to be a mirage, vanity, a vapor. So after exploring every conceivable pleasure, trying wisdom and testing foolishness, Solomon finds no solution to the problems under the sun. And so the teacher ends Ecclesiastes with the admonition to look beyond the sun, because by itself, this world holds no meaning. Solomon writes, the conclusion when everything has been heard is, fear God and keep his commandments. Anything we set out to do in this life, if it is not tethered to God, is ultimately an illusion, a vapor, vanity of vanities. But looking beyond the sun and casting our eyes on eternity is hard to do. Following God is often a challenge when we cannot see him directly. That's one reason that we gather together as a church body to remind one another to look beyond the sun and to hold fast to God. Ecclesiastes is sublime commentary on the first three chapters of the Bible. In Genesis, when God makes the world, he makes man and man proceeds to break the world. Solomon expertly sketches out the consequences of living in this broken world. He identifies six problems that plague this life. They are injustice, suffering, sameness, impermanence, unsatisfied desire, and mortality. The last three chapters of the Bible, where the apostle John describes the new heaven and the new earth, offer the resolution of how this broken world gets fixed. How interesting then that one of the things that happens when the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven to earth is that the sun is no longer necessary. John writes in Revelation 21, and the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light and its lamp is the lamb. It's as if that barrier that divided everyday life from eternal life is now gone. The sun is no longer needed because God is no longer unseen. His glory will be there for all to behold and his light for all to walk by. And unlike this world now, there will be no sphere of living that is separate from God. What's amazing about the last three chapters of Revelation is how they specifically address each of those six problems that Solomon raises in Ecclesiastes. Solomon observes that in this life, injustice abounds, and those who do wrong go unpunished. He writes in chapter 3, Moreover, I saw under the sun that in place of justice, even there was wickedness, and in the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. How can the pursuit of a just and righteous life be meaningful if wickedness goes unpunished? Well, John offers a response in Revelation 20, when he tells us of what is to come, he writes, 
And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. In the new creation, there will be no injustice, and every deed performed in this present life will be judged. Solomon looks around this world, and he sees great suffering, which cannot be explained or wiped away. He writes in chapter 4, I saw the tears of those who are suffering. They don't have anyone to comfort them. But John tells us in Revelation 21, he tells us of the great comforter and of a time when suffering will cease. He writes, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. In the new creation, there will be no suffering because God will have removed the source of suffering. Sin will be no more. Solomon reflects on this world, and he sees that beneath the news of the day, behind the novelty, there is an oppressive sameness. Men are born, they work, they die, and are then forgotten. Empires rise and fall just as the sun rises and sets. It all becomes wearisome and then desperate, for it means there is no way out, no exit from this life. Solomon writes, what has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. But John assures us there is a way out of this sameness, this fatalism, this repeating cycle. John writes in Revelation 21, and he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. Back to Ecclesiastes, the problem with death is not just that we die, but our heirs die too, and we are soon forgotten. We spend our lives building houses that others end up living in. None of our accomplishments have lasting value. There is nothing to hand down nor hold on to. Solomon writes, what does man gain by all the labor at which he toils under the sun? But John tells us of an inheritance that lasts forever because it comes from an everlasting God. He writes in Revelation 21, those who overcome will inherit all this and I will be their God and they will be my children. As short as our life is, it is frustrated by our inability to satisfy our many desires in any enduring way. Solomon tried every kind of satisfaction imaginable. Power and wealth, women and sex, wine and good food, wisdom and learning, song and mirth, none of it could quench the need for more. He writes in chapter six, a man to whom God gives wealth, possessions and honor so that he lacks nothing of all that he desires, yet God does not give him power to enjoy them. God does not give us the power to enjoy our possessions or satisfy our appetites because he wants us to find the only thing that does offer fulfillment. And John tells us of living waters that do finally quench our thirst, our great need. He writes in Revelation 21, and he said to me, it is done, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. Finally, over and over again, Solomon despairs over his mortality. Death is the original curse that brought with it all these other afflictions. He writes, all go to one place, all are from the dust, and to dust all return. But in the last chapter of Revelation, John tells us that the curse will be lifted. He writes, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the lamb through the middle of the street of the city on either side of the river, the tree of life. This is where our hope lies in this new creation. For those who trust in Jesus and what he accomplished for us on the cross, we have this new world to look forward to. Let us give thanks to our Lord and let's pray. Father God, we thank you for setting eternity in our heart, for making us long for you. 
and for all the ways you make this life point us to our need for you. Lord Jesus, we thank you that in your great love, you have gone ahead of us and prepared a place for us, and that in your great mercy, you shed your blood to wash us clean so we may enter the new creation. Holy Spirit, we ask that you kindle our hope and help us keep our eyes cast on eternity. Amen. You got your Bibles, go ahead and uh, turn them to uh, Psalm chapter 12. Turn to Psalm 12. There is uh, an outline there in your bulletin as well. If you'd like to take notes and follow along, you can grab that. Indeed, we are not home yet, are we? And many reminders of this week, many reminders of any given week are there in headlines and all over in the course even of our own personal lives. But praise God that uh, the future that we anticipate is one that is glorious and good only because of what our Savior has done on our behalf. He is our hope. Psalm 12, if you would go ahead and find that spot, and then would you do this with me? This morning, would you go ahead and stand as we read that psalm, and then we will pray, and then, I don't know, we might, I might let you sit back down at that point, and then we'll continue forward. Psalm 12. This, brothers and sisters, is the word of the Lord. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases to be, for the faithful disappear from among the sons of men. They speak falsehood to one another with flattering lips and with a double heart they speak. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that speaks great things, who have said with our tongue we will prevail, our lips are our own, who is Lord over us? Because of the devastation of the afflicted, because of the groaning of the needy, now I will arise, says the Lord. I will set him in the safety for which he longs. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace on the earth refined seven times. You, O Lord, will keep them. You will preserve him from this generation forever. The wicked strut about on every side when vileness is exalted among the sons of men. Let's pray. Ah, Lord God, it is true, we are not yet home. There is brokenness in this world. There is brokenness in our lives. There is brokenness even in ourselves as we come today to offer you worship. We fall short, and yet, Lord God, we rejoice, not only in a future day, which we do celebrate, but we rejoice in the spirit you give today, the kingdom that you build in hearts, the presence of Lord Jesus, that you come to give us with you and with your Father by what you have done. Lord, we ask, help us today 
And help us in this generation to be a people of truth and of your grace. Grant that you would remind us who you are this morning and that we would know whose we are. Speak now and give us words as we go from here. Give us language as we go from here to understand our own day and to fortify our own souls. This is what we ask. All for your glory in Christ's name. Amen. You guys can be seated. Psalm 12 that we've just read is a lament. It's a lament and a request in an evil day. Every lament is inherently a request at some level because what a lament is doing is it is seeking the empathy of the one who has the greatest cause of all to lament. In other words, when we come and we cry out and we say, Lord, this is so broken, we come because we know he understands. He sees the brokenness much more than we could ever see. He empathizes and gets it. He is not only able to resonate, but he himself is the fountain and the definition and the standard of all goodness and all truth is the one to whom we come to, 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 to get rescripted, to get reset, to see things anew from his perspective as we pour out our hearts. And, and in that lament, there is an inherent request. Lord God, why? Lord God, do something. Lord God, make it right. Otherwise, why would we come? I mean, unless you just, you know, dig the personal therapy that comes from it, although that is a huge blessing that God grants peace by his spirit. But sometimes we know, especially when we're deeply grieved, that just feeling better isn't enough. We need God to act. We ask the Lord to move. We come to Psalm 12 today with lament and request. I think it is fitting for any number of reasons, and arguably we could do that just about any Sunday of the year. But we come to do that today, I think, fitting. We come to the one who is sovereign, both to understand the need for lament in our broken world and the one sovereign as well to act in that world. In our passage today, though, there are a couple of requests that the psalmist makes that are explicit in addition to this overarching implicit call for God to act and to move. A writer of this psalm seeks, seeks something particular. He seeks the Lord to help him, to help him be faithful. He comes to the Lord and he says, there is faithful, faithlessness all around me. Lord, my God, help me come and help so that I might be found faithful. First, in our passage, we meet a description of the day of the psalmist where he mourns the loss of virtue and the lost loss of faithfulness. First, we see in verse one, the first lament and the request, the lament, Lord, the faithful are disappearing. Lord, the faithful are disappearing. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases to be, for the faithful disappear from among the sons of men. What do you think? Do you think that our generation today is largely marked by the growing of a people of faithfulness? That our society, and even outside of the church, and outside of faith, and outside of religious observance of things, in that, and things of that nature, that just in general our society is marked by faithfulness, and by loyalty, by consistency, and by truth. Boy, the cynicism could be thick right now in this moment, couldn't it? And it hurts sometimes how far we are from what the Lord would have us be. And then we have markers that happen, <laughs> occasions in the course of the regular passing of time that sort of stand as a signpost, don't they? Like the passing of Elizabeth. It feels a bit like not just the passing of a woman or a life. It feels a bit like the passing of an era, doesn't it? Was she a faithful follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? I don't know. There are absolutely some who would say so, and I would love to believe so, and I'm not going to argue otherwise here this morning, just to say I didn't know her, so I won't speak authoritatively. I've heard some of the confessions that she has made of her trust in the Lord Jesus, and they are beautiful. I don't know for sure the truth of what many have said of her, but I do know 
that she held in her countenance and in her life a dignity, a dignity that seemed at the very least to be passing away even within the course of her own lifetime and her own generation, right? And with her passing feels almost like a big dose of it, we feel, is gone. At the very least, the new subjects of the crown will inherit a very different dignitary than the one that passed, no matter who it is. Because the generation is just producing a different kind of people, it feels like today. It feels like she was the last in a long and noble lineage. Sort of the end of the second Elizabethan age. What of, then, the general state of faithfulness? What of the progress of our society? Are we looking for more faithfulness there? What about the state of the family today? What about our own communities? What about even within the church? Are we seeing an overwhelming growth in faithfulness? I genuinely ask this and leave it to your own discretion. You can say, well, it depends on which side of the bed I roll out of that morning. But the question is, are we seeing a new wave of the faithful wherever we go? You can decide, but I think we would all agree there is most definitely room for lament. Lord, the faithful are disappearing, the psalmist says. But here's the thing. Our hope is not in the good old days, is it? And we need to be careful not to fall into that trap. Uh, those who tend to be more conservative tend to want to look back to the days when things were better. Guess what? Things have never really been good. The world's always been broken. The human heart has always been depraved. We have always need redemption. There has always been wickedness. Our hope is not in the good old days. It's in the ancient truths. Our hope is not in the generation or two that's passed from the scene most recently. It's in a Lord who is timeless. And our commission is to be found faithful regardless of the generation in which the Lord places us. That's what the psalmist asks for in this psalm with his lament, is to be found faithful. And so it is the call for us and for every generation of true believers. Having been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, Peter says, we are now placed in covenant, covenant with God through blood and, and by the sealing of the Spirit now. So then now we're called to be uh, those who keep covenant with the Lord. We can find the language of the keeping of covenant throughout the Old Testament, but I'll just point one of those up for you. You can jot down Psalm 103, 17 and 18. Psalm 103, 17 and 18. But the loving kindness of the Lord, by the way, loving kindness, if you've been around here at all, you know is uh, the magic English word for chesed, which means God's loyal love, his covenant love. But the covenant love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember his precepts to do them. That's the promise to every generation of those who have come to be by God's grace in covenant with him, now to be those who keep covenant. Or to use the same words in different language, we find in the New Testament the Lord Jesus' encouragement to be those who keep faith. And he himself laments after a particularly difficult situation in Luke 18. But when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? And the question is put to us, will we be those who keep faith? Now, the psalmist in Psalm 12 is writing in a time where the difficulties of his day, the circumstances of his generation are peculiarly difficult, tempting and drawing him away from faithfulness to the Lord. But here's the thing. There are fairgrounds of sin that find their home in our hearts long before we even get to the influence of the world, right? I don't need help to be faithless. My flesh can lead me there any given moment of any given day of the week. How much harder is it to be faithful when the prevailing winds blow against covenant keeping? The good news is that Christ is sufficient for both. And Yahweh and his grace was sufficient for both 
in the day of the psalmist as he turns to him. And so we, we, like he, sense our need as we read this. The godly man, Lord, ceases to be. The faithful disappear from among the sons of men. And so we share in the psalmist's lament. And so then we share also in his request in this opening verse. Did you catch it? I skipped over it. It was awful quick. It was one word. It was the first word. Help, he says. There you go. That's it. Help. The content of his request is not specified. The help that he asks for, at least in this verse, at least when he first utters it, is not elaborated upon. It will be, I believe, just by seeing the context overall. It's just a single word. Clearly, the dwindling of the godly weighs upon the psalmist at this point. As I think, as I think it is right to weigh upon all of those who know the Lord. Lord, as I look around, it weighs upon me. Is there growing evidence of faithfulness in my family, in my community, in my society, in the world you have made, in the church? in the leaders of our day. Is there, Lord? If not, then, oh, Lord, we lament. And so, like the psalmist, we come this morning. We come for succor. We come for relief and for aid to the one who not only understands that, who not only sees the faithlessness even better than we see it, but he is the God who can create faithfulness. You see, lament in and of itself is not a pity party. Lament is not by itself worthless. Lament is powerful. Lament realigns us. Lament pleads with God. Lament meets him on his terms with, with his standard and says, I, I, I don't see your standard, Lord. Do, do your stuff. I stand in agreement with you. Lord, help, the psalmist says. Just that single word for now. But in that single word comes volumes of theology, does it not? Here we have the, the covenant man. By the way, the word behind godly man at the beginning of verse 1 is the word chasid, which is related. It's derived from the same root for chesed. So that's why I'm going to call him the covenant man. What he says here is the covenant man, the covenant woman, the covenant person ceases to be as I look around. Where is the covenant keeper? And then he just cries out, help. So much that we could say just in that one word about our dependence and God's sufficiency, about what we should do when we see brokenness in our world. So many things the psalmist could have done, but the one thing he did above and beyond all was to come to the Lord and to pray, to ask that single word, help. The covenant man is a praying man. The covenant woman is a praying woman. Because therein lies dependence, and without it, there will be no faithfulness. Where do you turn for relief when the world presses upon you? When the playgrounds of sin in your own life run rampant? Where do you turn when depression, when a sense of being overwhelmed with all that is broken, comes in and presses upon you? Do you just pursue distractions? I'm prone to want to do so, for sure. But the covenant man, the covenant woman, the psalmist knows where help lies and turns to the Lord. Well, that's the opening verse, so uh, we better move on. We get the second lament then and the second request starting in verse 2. Lord, the wicked destroy with their speech. The wicked destroy with their speech. The first lament is for the loss, uh, loss of something that which is good. The second is for the abundance of that which is bad. And both are to be lamented. The psalmist again describes his day, a day of lies and a day of treachery. Notice, notice at least six ways. You could slice this maybe even more, but at least six ways that speech is made treacherous in this age that the psalmist gives us. Three treacherous uses of speech in verse 2. They speak falsehood to one another with flattering lips and with a double heart they speak. In other words, he says they speak emptiness. They have smooth speech and they use double talk, hypocrisy. 
Do you think in our day we could find any examples of speech that is emptiness or speech that is smooth to persuade or double talk? No, not in our world. Boston Children's Hospital in our day is proudly proclaiming itself to be and is a leader in gender-affirming surgeries. But this is emptiness in its most violent form. It is not gender affirming these surgeries. It is gender destroying. It is gender confusing. It is gender muddling. It is soul searing. They would flatter themselves as liberators, setting free gender identities for those who are trapped within bodies, they would say, where they do not belong. But a closer description would be child abuse, were it to have happened in any other generation and under any other circumstances. We grieve. We grieve that some are, are actually so hurt and so confused and so deceived and and so desperate that they would mutilate themselves for the sake of the hope of acceptance, for the sake of, of the hope of peace in their souls, that they know no other way to find to escape into. And so into that muddled confusion of pain comes speech, which is, friends, nothing but treachery, right? To pick merely a single example. Or the wicked destroy with their speech. A fourth way is there in verse 3. Boasting. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips. The tongue that speaks great things. Let's face it. Nowadays you can't get clicks. You can't hold eyeballs. You can't get attention without great boasts. Right? Who cares if it's true? It sells. Right? And then a. Uh, a dominating, manipulating speech. In verse 4, they have said, with our tongue we will prevail. The psalmist says that, that these are those that in their wickedness they would, they would purposely manipulate by their speech. It doesn't matter if we need to lie or deceive. Just speak smoothly. Just make it sound good like oil that goes down without any chewing. You don't have to cogitate on that. It just slides right in. The double talk that says one thing and then another, but no, it's okay, just move along. Nothing to see here. With our tongue, we will prevail. And lastly, it's God defying. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? In this world, brothers and sisters, we need to know that we might be able to win if we lie. And we need to resolve ahead of time that that's not worth it, right? We need to resolve ahead of time that to stoop to all of the things which are sold to us, that are marketed to us, all the, the means by which others might win, we must say, look, as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're a people of truth, and I have no other choice. Even if I lose, that's God's problem. That's God's deal. He's big enough. Even if I lose, I'm going to be a covenant woman or a covenant man and not let my speech be of these kinds. It hurts when the world does this and it seems they gain the eyeballs and they gain public attention and they win. Hurts even more so when somebody in the name of Christ does it though. Our generation is one that believes that we can define our own existence. That's what we have here at the end of verse four. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? Uh, Carl Truman has written a great book uh, about this, a great um, commentary on our cultural understanding and our moment called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. The, the dude's like a um, serious egg-headed intellectual, and he quotes a lot of phil philosophers, and he's awesome. And, and I read it, and I feel smart, and I can't understand most of it, but I feel smart when I'm done. Um, but, but what does come through real clearly is that um, the problem isn't just out there. The problem's in here. 
because I'm part and parcel of a culture that, that took the bait, swallowed it, and has been in like since the beginning. It's part of my DNA. And so fettering my way out of it is difficult. Um, let me read to you one of the quotes that he makes of uh, Charles Taylor on uh, what is known as expressive individualism. You go, what is expressive individualism? I would just say, apart from Jesus, it's everything you believe, okay? Y you are expressive individualism, and so am I, apart from Jesus. Ready? Here's the description. This is the understanding of life that emerges with the romantic expressivism of the late 18th century, that each of us has his or her own way of realizing our humanity, and that it is important to find and to live out one's own humanity as against surrendering to conformity with a model imposed on us from the outside by society or by the previous generation or by religious or political authority of any kind. That sounds good, doesn't it? Mo mostly because we're awash in it. We're like, yeah, of course, I agree with that. But the problem is that that worldview exalts the individual to be the final and the only authority in their lives. No society can survive that tries to build on that foundation. That is the foundation upon which our society is building itself and rebuilding itself today. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? And so, oh Lord, help us. We lament for the wickedness we see in the world and how it reflects so often at times the brokenness even in my own soul. Those who speak and believe as if they are answerable to no one will not be too terribly concerned what they destroy in the process. Oh, Lord, have mercy on us that we not be the same. Lament, Lord, the wicked destroy with their speech. And then comes the request, his second request, cut them off. There it is at the beginning of verse 3. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips. You know, sometimes scripture speaks so directly we're uncomfortable with it. But when it comes to real wickedness, it is actually a source of great relief that God sees clearly. Understand what the psalmist is not doing here. He is not saying, I'm going to go cut off some flattering lips. He comes before the Lord with his lament. And he says, oh, Lord, cut them off. The vengeance is yours, you will repay. And so the psalmist comes and puts them in the Lord's hands. That's what a good lament does. It places all things under the lordship of the creator and the God who is wise. This kind of, of a refrain asking for God to be Lord over all, that's common in the Psalms. It asks for the Lord to judge with equity and to act in righteousness, and he will. One day, as we've already been reminded this morning, praise God for that. The psalmist entrusts this entire situation into the perfect wisdom and the perfect mercy and the perfect power of the only one who fully understands how to execute all judgments. And that is a glorious place to be, putting it in his hands. The desire for evil to be judged. What am I going to say next? is absolutely a good thing. It is absolutely a good thing. Why? Because you were made in the image of God. You have an innate sense of righteousness and unrighteousness. You were created as a moral being. Every human being is and was and does. Now, our conscience gets seared. Our understanding gets skewed. Our sense of righteousness gets perverted. But understand that we can't escape moral judgments. And when we come and we bring our injustices to the Lord and we cry out, he is the one who cleanses those and scrubs them and fortifies them. And the psalmist is doing what is right and good, and it is also right and good for us to do. Lord, we desire that evil would be judged. Restrain the wicked. Break the arm. Shatter the teeth. This is the language of the psalms, right? The Lord will judge with equity and righteousness. Here the psalmist asks for that. We long for evil to be finally put away one day. For all lies to be answered one day. And all things to be put under the lordship of Christ. And they will be. 
Psalm 98, you can jot down 98 verses 7 through 9. Revel with me, brothers and sisters, in these truths. Let the sea roar in all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the mountains sing together for joy before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. That's our celebration. He will do it perfectly in his day. Lord, the wicked destroy with their speech, but there is a day, so we put them in your hands. Now, this is the, lim the lament, the first half, the psalmist crying out. But something wonderful happens in the middle of the psalm. Something miraculous happens in the middle of the psalm, and that is that Yahweh hears and he responds. I would dig it if I prayed like this, and while I was praying, God decided to answer. You've had moments like that, and you go, wow, thank you, Lord. Thank you that you hear and you know. Yahweh responds now in verse 5 in compassion, and he says, I will arise. Because of the devastation of the afflicted, because of the groaning of the needy, now I will arise, says the Lord. I will set him in the safety for which he longs. Speaking of that needy one, speaking of that afflicted one. Here Yahweh not only hears what the psalmist has said, but guys, understand, he, he is seen. Did, did, did the psalmist say anything about devastation? I mean, no, I guess it could be implied. But he didn't say anything about how he's being affected. Did he say anything about affliction or groaning? No, he didn't say any of those things. Why? Because he's not informing God of something the Lord doesn't already know. The Lord has already seen the devastation. He already knows the afflicted. He has already heard the groaning, and he is well acquainted with the needy. Brothers and sisters, do not think that the Lord God does not know the grief of this age. Right? Do not think for a moment the Lord God does not get it. Long before we ever bring it to him, long before we ever have such burden in our soul to cry out and say, Lord God, why? Long before. He's already seen it. His compassion has gone ahead. And here then now are words of promise. He says he will rescue the needy, the afflicted, the groaning. Because of their devastation, he says, now I will arise. And then where, where, where's the promise? Look at this at the end of verse 5. I will set him in the safety for which he longs. He desires truth to be his experience, this broken one. He, he desires that resonating that he knows inherently in his soul to be true and right and real. He longs for it, and the Lord says, I'll give it to him. One day I'll bring him safely into that place. What a great promise that is to chew on. If it's your desire to be faithful in this generation, then know that the Lord loves to rescue those who pray like that, right? These are the kind of people we should be. These kind of praying covenant men and women he will rescue. We're reminded again at this point that the battle is not really out there, right? The battle is not against flesh and blood, Ephesians says. The battle is here in our hearts. There is no one and there are no circumstances that can make you unfaithful. Oh, I blame all kinds of things for making me unfaithful, but it's a lie. All my circumstances can do, all the people can do, is to expose the unfaithfulness if it's already there in my heart. But there is one who can make me faithful. And this is what the psalmist longs for. And this is what Yahweh says, I will do. I will set him in the safety for which he longs. So that he might be fortified to be faithful no matter the difficulty of his day. That is a good word. Let him help make you faithful by the spirit that he gives. Now... Yahweh having answered, the psalmist now speaks, and it's a whole new day. 
the lament has not gone away completely. It'll circle back at the end. The circumstances have not yet even necessarily changed one iota, as the end will show, but everything that really matters has. And so the psalmist now in 6 and 7 stands upon this promise, and he proclaims Yahweh builds his people with his word. Yahweh builds his people with his word. And I hope you catch the poetic beauty of this, because if, if the wicked can destroy with their speech, then the Lord God can thwart all that by a word. How about the words of Yahweh, verse 6? The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace on the earth, refined seven times, you, O Lord, will keep them. You will preserve him from this generation forever. This is the psalmist now embracing, soaking in what, what, as best as I could understand it, I can only interpret as the Spirit of God supernaturally communicating to him the answer of Yahweh. The psalm is ascribed to David. We know that David acted as a prophet. So apparently a supernatural revelation has spoken to David in verse 5. I don't have any problem with that. It happens lots of other places with David and lots of other places in Scripture. And so the psalmist, probably David, but even as it's recorded by the psalmist who compiled this and all of God's people since, stands now on that promise. And he says, I hate all that speech, and it, it breaks my heart, and it cuts me to the quick. But Lord, your speech, huh, your speech, no more slippery ground, right? No more double talk, no more, no more lies, just the truth that fortifies just, just reality that sets me straight again. Words tried as in a furnace seven times over. This promise to bring me into safety for which I long. Lord God, this builds me. This promise builds you. And what is the psalmist doing in 6 and 7? This is now his resolve to stand in confidence upon what Yahweh has said. Have the circumstances changed? No. Has anything else changed? Yes, everything, as far as the psalmist is concerned. The covenant man, the covenant woman, responds with resolve when she hears the word of the Lord and builds her life upon that, right? God has said, I will preserve. And so the psalmist echoes it there in seven. You will preserve. I love it. What a rejoicing. What a celebration. You think that's music in the ears of the Lord to hear his beleaguered saint speak back to him the truths that he has promised to his child. Huh. Now, one of the reasons, as I've already alluded to, that I am calling this resolve at this point is because the situation hasn't changed. It's not just celebration. It's not just uh, victory, right? It's not just praise, right? Those are all fitting descriptions after God wins. And we have a lot of those in the Psalms. But as far as the circumstances, nothing has changed except the psalmist. And so the need remains in verse 8, and there is a final lament the reality of a society in corruption still. The wicked strut about on every side when vileness is exalted among the sons of men. Five decades after the triumph of the sexual revolution in the United States of America, how do you think we stand? Do you think these words could maybe describe us, the wicked strut about on every side when vileness is exalted among the sons of men? <laughs> We live in a pornified society. It just is. It just is what is in this world today in ways that we, I mean, I don't, I, don't even know, I don't even know anything different. I've never known anything different in my lifetime. We're awash in images. We're regularly fed lies about both homosexual and heterosexual lies and other perversions, right? Regularly. And that's just to pick one issue. Is wickedness exalted among the sons of men in our day? Sure it is. So what are the righteous to do? 
We're there to walk faithfully, but man, the problem is those seeds have already gone deep into my heart, so I need a lot of help every single day. I need the grace of God every single day. And so do you. And then when the world calls to us, it's doubly hard. And so sometimes the very best thing we do is fall on our knees, throw up our hands, and we lament like a good covenant man would do, right? And when we lament, we remember there is one. There is one who keeps his covenant. There is one who does stay faithful. And he cannot lie. He cannot double speak. Oh, he's persuasive, but it's not because of smoothness and flattery. It, becomes, it comes from the, the power of character and the authority of his very being. He speaks truth because he is the way and the truth and the life. And he is your hope and mine to be rescued. And he preserves his own. Brothers and sisters, no one can make you unfaithful. No one has the power to do that. So, when you feel the temptation to be so, or you feel the grief of being overwhelmed in a world that isn't, pray this lament. I commend it to you. It's a good one for me this week. Cast your requests upon him. Recall his great compassion. Build upon his word and resolve like the psalmist. Stand with me and let's pray. Gracious God, our Father, we love you, we treasure you, we cherish you, and we relish the truth of your word. We need your help in a myriad of ways to rescue us from, from misunderstandings and confusions and lies that have become so much a part of us that we don't even realize it. We're blind. But you, Lord God, are glorious and good. Bring your light. Bring your truth into our hearts and our lives this week. Thank you that you rescue us. And praise you that when we cry out for grief in the brokenness in our world, that you don't chastise us for bringing so much of it ourselves, but you, you welcome us. And you do your surgery. And you begin to heal. And then there you protect and you keep and you preserve. Lord God, let us be those who are faithful. Help us to be faithful for I can't do it on my own. And thank you for Christ who is so perfectly faithful in my place. And Holy Spirit, for you coming to do that in me. This is what we ask and we will praise you for it ahead of time. All for your glory in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for worshiping with us. Have a great weekend.